it's Christine, Stitch All the Things. Um, today I'm going to do the tutorial for making a throw pillow out of one of your finished cross stitch pieces. Um, so first off are the materials you're going to need. You're going to need your finished cross stitch piece. You're going to need a piece of backing for it, so backing fabric. Um, my cross stitch piece is small enough that a quarter yard if the fabric shop cut it correctly would be just enough. So um, I would recommend getting a fat quarter at least um, and you should you should be fine with about a fat quarter depending on how big your piece is. If your piece is really big you may want to get half a yard so you're going to have to measure that and figure it out. Um, the other thing you're going to need is some fusible interfacing. I typically use um, Pellon um, SF101 Shape Flex um, and you'll want to get white or black or darker one depending on your fabric. This pillow that I made the other day I actually used a dark fusible interfacing. It doesn't have to be Shape Flex it just needs to be a light weight interfacing. You don't want anything really thick or heavy. Um, you just need something that's going to protect the back of your stitching so that as you're making this pillow, stuffing it, um, your st stitches don't pop out, your thread ends don't pop out, and to keep any of the polyfill from coming through in the holes. I'm using Ada. It's not like a linen or even weave, so the holes are closed a little more, but I'm still... <laughs> my dog just sneezed. Um, I'm still going to put... Um, interfacing on mine because this polyfill, I'm telling you, it will creep into any little any little hole you have. You're gonna have polyfill coming out of it. So lightweight interfacing, fusible, not sewing. Um, the other uh, material you're gonna need is, of course, uh, matching thread. I always match my thread to the front of my pillow um, because if any stitches show, mainly when hand stitching the end closed, if you happen to get part a part of a stitch on the front of your fabric, it'll blend right in. And then of course, um, polyfill. Uh, as far as tools that you'll need, you're going to need a rotary cutter, a ruler, and a cutting mat. And my cutting mat is actually a big one. It's on the table. Um, you don't have to have a big one like this. Um, now, if you don't have these tools, you do not have to go out and buy it. You can just cut it by hand. So if you cut it by hand, you're of course going to need scissors. We're going to need scissors no matter what. Um, uh, if you cut it by hand, you're going to want some bigger scissors. If, if you're not going to cut it by hand, you're going to use the rotary cutter. Then we're just going to need um, a smaller pair of scissors. Um, I don't have them, but I use a pair of six six inch scissors for for some little um, cutting we'll have to do later, trimming up the pillow and everything. Um, you'll need a ruler and you'll need a marking tool. I typically use um, just graphite pencil. I use a mechanical pencil, but you can use whatever you'd mark with um, chalk pencil or, or whatever. And this is only if you're cutting it by hand. Um, the other thing you're going to need, of course, is we're going to need some pins for when we pin everything together. I don't know if you can see that very well. I just use a magnetic thing. And my lint roller was next to it. I picked up all the pins. Well, not all. That's a bit of dramatization. You'll, uh, you're also going to need um, a needle for when we sew this closed by hand at the end. It's not hard. So if that kind of deters you from, oh, I don't know if I want to do this, don't worry about it, people. Um, so I put my needles on a different magnetic thing. So pins for pinning our stuff together, needle for sewing at the end. Um, oh, material, forgot, trim. For, um, you don't have to have trim on your pillow. It's not necessary, but if you'd like to, you can, you can of course have it. I was going to make this pillow without the trim and then decided that I wanted to show you how I do it in the video. So this pillow now has some trim. Um, it can be whatever you want. I found these things, they look like pom-poms. They're not really pom-poms. It's like, um, 
like little nylon strands that they folded over and make it look like a pom-pom. And if you're doing trim, you're going to need one of these little lighter things um, to melt the edges if your trim is made of nylon or polyester. Think plastic. If it's cotton, don't do this. You don't need it. And then of course the lint roller for at the end. I laughed so hard when I looked at my video or a picture of this finished piece. I had a huge piece of lint right here on the chandelier. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even roll it. So a lint roller to roll that off. And then other tools you need, sewing machine of course. We're gonna need an iron to press our interfacing onto the back of the piece. Now I have to stop here really quickly and say that I actually did this video, started this video yesterday, and then my washing machine completely went out on us in the middle of the day and everything stopped until we tore it apart to find out what was wrong with it and then decided it's not worth buying the part and replacing it so we bought a new one and got it installed today. So unfortunately part of my video where I, I've already cut the, the fabrics down to the right size, I fused it all, um, that's all done so I'm just going to insert that chunk after this but yesterday was such a hot mess I just need to start over. Um, so anyway, I don't, I don't even know why I stopped to say that. Um, iron, I don't use a steam iron. Um, I have found, I, I have a Rowenta and it's the one made in Germany, it still leaks. So instead of doing that, what I do is I use spray, uh, just a bottle of water and spray a, um, a tea towel over the top, just a cotton tea towel. So my tools include iron, spray bottle of water and a tea towel as well as in this case for stitching you need a fluffy towel to lay your stitching on so stitch side down um, and it'll keep your stitches from going too flat or flat um, double it up if you if you want to make it nice and fluffy mine's gone a little a little flat but um, I think that's it as far as tools that you need um, and I want to also say that this video is going to, as I move the camera around to set it up for um, yesterday when I set it up for cutting your pieces and then set it up at the ironing board and then set it up for the sewing machine, they're going to have some transitions, um, not to mention all the disaster that went on yesterday. So please be patient with it as it, as it does the transition. Um, just know it's because I've had to set up stuff and then and then start the video up again um, and what I'd like to do is um, do a quick little um, video I'm going to insert it uh, about just a basic sewing machine this is not my normal sewing machine um, I sew on a, a heavier duty machine it's a semi industrial straight stitch machine uh, but I I've received many comments over the past couple years mainly from cross stitchers on my feed of when they see things sewn like I have a sewing machine but I, I haven't used it yet I don't know what to do with it I'm a little intimidated by it or it's still sitting in a box in my closet and so what I decided to do is just get out my starter sewing machine I got years and years ago I shouldn't say, it hasn't been that long probably six or so and I don't use this every day so essentially mine's been sitting in a box in the closet. Um, but I'm going to go over just the basic parts of the sewing machine. I want this to be fun for you guys and I don't want anything to seem intimidating or that's too hard because it's not. This is going to be super fun but I'm just going to go over the basic parts. Now if you don't want to watch that and you got your sewing machine down and you're good to go then um, you can fast forward the video to this time and then um, just pause or fast forward and pause and gather your supplies whatever you don't have to watch it um, but I will be inserting just a little discussion about basic sewing machine here okay let's get started on the machine right up here in the back this is your spool pin this will go up and down in some machines um, basically for when you transport it you can push it down and then you don't have to worry about anything damaging it or popping it off and your spool goes up there 
a spool of thread. Lots of different kinds of spools of thread, so um, if mine seems different than what you're used to, don't worry. It's just a different brand. Uh, this right here is the bobbin winder. What you do is you take your thread, and most machines will have a little arm over here, a little thread guide, and you take it, oops, going the wrong way, I need two hands, and you bring your thread over, and I still did that. Completely wrong. I knew I was right the first time. Anyway, and you'll stick a little plastic bobbin right up here, and you'll wind a little thread piece up through it, and then click that over, press the, um, the foot pedal, and then it'll wind the thread on your bobbin. Then you just cut this off and take your bobbin off. It'll automatically, when, when the bobbin fills, this right here is a guide so that it knows as it fills, it pushes, the thread will fill up, push against this, and push this out, and it'll pop over and stop winding your bobbin. Right up here, this is your stitch width this way, wide. Um, it works for all of the, the specialty stitches you may have on your machine, like zigzag and stuff. So it's how wide you want your zigzag. If you want it short or wide, that's what this one is. This knob right here, or dial I should say, this is your tension. So as you take your thread, this arm right here is also to help um, help you with your thread tension. And before I go on, I should note, my machine and yours too may have some diagrams printed on the top. And these two right here are for winding the bobbin. This one is to tell you how to put the thread in here to thread your machine. Um, please read your manuals. Don't go off just what I say. Um, and if your machine doesn't have a manual or you're uncertain how it works, check YouTube. I, there are YouTube videos for everything. Just put in your model and your brand and what you want to learn and how to thread a Brother XL 3750. I'm sure someone has a tutorial for that. And if they don't tell me, maybe I'll do it. Who knows? Um, so anyway, this will tell you how to thread your machine in this guide. And you'll put it in here. Now there is a metal arm that goes up and down. That's your thread take-up lever. And the thread will automatically put itself in there. And so you're just, all these parts are your thread. And into the needle. And your thread tension. All of this stuff is managed with this dial. And you want pretty stitches. So if you're seeing little dots of stitches pop up on the top, it means your top thread is pulling your bottom stitches up. You need to loosen this. If all of your, your, you're seeing thread bumps on the bottom of your material, it means your bobbin is pulling all of your thread down, so you need to tighten the top thread. Basically, your stitches are interlocking, and it's like a battle, and you want them to meet right in the middle. Okay, down here is your bobbin case. Some machines will load it from the front, and some will load it from the top. My other machine loads it from the side. Um, there's a little lever here. You pull it, and this top will come right off in mine, and you drop your bobbin in. Then you put that back in, close it. This is your presser foot, and there's a lever back here that raises it. Sometimes that lever faces right off the back of the machine, so you have to Put your hand in and around and lift it up. Mine just does it from the side. And this is your needle arm and your needle bar, I should say. The needle's already in it. This hand wheel right here um, towards you makes your fabric feed that way, which is forward. Because you're going to be, you want your fabric to go to away from you, and that's actually forward. When you crank your wheel away from you, that's actually doing stitches in reverse. Seems a little odd, but as you sew, you'll you'll get it. Right here, they've got printed all my stitches. Some sewing machines will just have you push a button because it's computerized, and so that selects your stitches. 
This this little thing right here is for your buttonholer. I don't use the buttonholer attachments. I don't really make clothes right now, so I don't use this. These two knobs right here, there's actually two that turn. This one right here is your stitch selector. So all of these numbers up here, you select the number you want, and then this arrow, you line it up with that. This here is actually your stitch length how long you want your stitches. So think of a straight stitch, how long you want the straight stitch. It'll work for these zigzags on the first row right here. Um, if you want your zigzag, you've figured out how wide, but now you want to know how long. So if you want them wide and short, it'll be like this. But if you want them wide and long, like that. And it's kind of hard to show in the camera that way. And I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm out of breath. When I have noticed in my videos when I'm trying to explain stuff, maybe it's that I talk too much and, and need to be calmer. That's probably it. You guys know how excitable I get. Okay, this knob we just talked about stitch length, but if you'll notice, they, they were nice and color coded my machine for me. So if I want any stitches right here on this row, which is green and labeled SS2, I turned the whole knob over to where SS2 is under that arrow and lined up. I don't have any control over the stitch length, but I still do over the width. Same thing for SS1, all of these there, turn this over. No control over the length, it does it. It just says whatever the stitch here is in this row, that's the one we're going to do, but I still have control over the width. This button right here is your reverse. When you are want to go in reverse, you have to depress the lever and keep it held down while you're pressing on the foot pedal to go in reverse. And then when you're done, lift this up and your foot pedal up at the same time. Over here on the side, this is your power cord. And some will have, like this one, there's actually two cords to this. One goes to the foot pedal and one goes to the outlet. That's your power source. Um, some machines will have them as separate cords. And then of course, the power button. Oh, I unplugged it um, because I had it, it plugged in right behind and all you could see was this big black Thing running down the back of the video and I didn't want that through most of it but there you go and your light bulbs up there uh, some machines will have I'm going to turn this off while I'm playing with it this little compartment right here you slide it off and now your machine becomes a free arm so if you're sewing something rather small and circular you want to take this off to be able to have it go around the arm of the machine it comes in really handy I don't sew like that often, but sometimes you need it. Th my bag of accessories, different feet and things, that was actually stored in here when I got the machine. And you might find a bag of accessories in this compartment if you have one like that. Um, that's it for this machine. People, this is really easy to use. We are going to have a lot of fun. Please don't be afraid of your machine or afraid to use it. You can't break it. Well, you can if you get mad and throw it off the table or something. So I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, maybe go drink a glass of wine or something first. Um, and that's actually a kind of a joke in the quilters groups that if you're getting really frustrated with your machine, have a glass of wine, then you won't care. We'll just have fun with it. Um, I think that's all I want to say about this for now. We are going to get back to starting our pillow. We have a pillow to make, people. Let's go have some fun. Okay, first we're going to start off with cutting this piece. Now, I told you I'm going to show you a trick. If you don't have a rotary color cutter and a ruler, I'm going to say color on this the whole video. Um, and I'm really sorry if the angle is off. I'm trying really hard to video this to where you can see what I'm doing from my perspective, but your angle is just slightly off. Um, if I was going to use a ruler and a pencil to do this, what I would do is turn it around to the back. So any marks I have are on the back. And I like to make my space around the pillow two inches 
the whole all the way around um, just because when you fill it out I like to have a little bit of space it lets it poof like this one and then it, there's some space between the edge of the pillow but you can see here that it's not a huge amount because of your um, your seam allowances I should quickly talk about that because as you go to cut this you can this information will help you figure out your seam allowance. If you want it really tight and close up around your stitching, for most pillows, I will use a 3 8 inch seam allowance. So what that means is from your final cut size, it's going to shrink up on the outside 3 quarters of an inch, both your height and your width, because you're taking in 3 8 inch from here and from here. I, I don't want it super tight around my my piece, but that's just my preference. Let's say you want a one inch um, space between your seam and your piece. You would cut this at one and three eighths, all sides, all the way around. Um, for me, I'm just cutting two inches because sometimes, depending on the trim, you may change your seam allowance. If I was using piping, which I forgot to get, Piping seam allowance from the edge of the piping to the raw edge of the, the fabric is about half an inch. For this trim, we've got about a quarter inch. And I just want the little balls sticking up. You can, you can have the whole thing, not the whole thing, you need some of it inside. But you can have a little bit of what it's attached to showing. That's not my preference. I just want only the little top little ball pieces sticking up out. And this is about a quarter inch right here. Okay, so I'm going to do two inches. So what I'm going to do, if I'm going to do this the old, old way, the, um, the, I don't want to say old way. That just sounds bad. Just, um... Come on, what's the word, people? What am I trying to say? Oh, a different way. Um, if you don't have a cutter and you want to do it this way. What I would do is, I, I like to have um, the bulk of my ruler that way. And this has um, millimeters, centimeters on the other side. Okay, I would find the top edge pieces here of my fabric. And I would just make a mark two inches out. And I would do that. Oops, did I do that right? Yeah. 10 right here. This is the 10 line. This is the 12 line. Here's my mark. I'm going to come down to the next area where I think that top... See, that's off. So, oh, my end popped up. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, for shame. So, did I do that at the right spot? No. And you know what? You can even follow that line. This is Ada. You can follow that line all the way down, make your marks. But what I would normally do is make a mark, come down little ways, make another mark, come down little ways, make another mark, and then do it like this, and then just make a mark all the way across. But because it's Ada, guys, this is super easy. My brain. Just tell you, make your mark all the way down. Do it around all four sides. Take your scissors, start cutting. On, on your line. Then what you want to do is take your backing piece after you've cut this out, lay it on your backing piece and you can either pin it and cut around it or draw a line. I would do it on the inside. Lay it here, draw a line, cut it or um, just lay it there and just hold it in place and cut it. If, you, if you're trying to fussy cut and get a certain part of the pattern in there then you're definitely going to want to draw a line and cut it. And same thing with your interfacing. Lay your interfacing out, lay your cut piece on top, and then just cut around. That's how you do it if you don't have access to a ruler and a rotary cutter and a cutting mat. But I do have access to those things. So let's get to work, people. <clears throat> okay, I am going to match up my two inches here to the topmost pieces, or topmost stitches all the way across the top. I have no idea. Is my arm in your way? Probably. I'm going to cut it all the way down. 
my trash cans over there. So it looks like I'm just going to fling things off. Okay. I'm going to line up this top edge here and the side end of the side stitches and cut. Done. Now, this is where I kind of end up liking the longer ruler. And I may get one because it's going to be easier for me. I have quilters, so don't judge me on all my rulers, people. I have a lot. A lot. Okay. So, I like to line up on the edges here. See this edge and that edge. And I still need two inches. This ruler's not big enough either. Always playing with my rulers. All right, we're gonna do this anyway. Okay, right here, I want two inches, and I still wanna make sure this is straight, and I'm on the, I'm on the, let's see, sixth and one eighth inch line. No, I'm not six, nine. Hello. You know what's sad, people? I'm a math idiot, and I quilt. It's just terrible. Okay, so I've got my two inches, and I'm lined up for the most part over here. I'm, I'm back about an eighth of an inch, but I'm going to be careful because I don't know if you can see my ruler does not extend two inches out here. So when I get here, I don't want my ruler to go off. I'm going to put this back because you can't really see. So I'm going to have to move my ruler halfway through my cut. So line my ruler up here, get cutting. You can see I, this is not normally how I cut. I'm normally cutting from the other direction. And see, I stop here because I need to move my ruler down. Make sure I'm still two inches. I'm sorry if you get my big fat face in the way. Oh, I shouldn't call myself fat. I was just, somebody was just complimenting me on my growth and not being mean to myself. And now I'm just was mean. Okay. Now I'm going to turn this so I can see. Got square edges all the way around should turn it so we have an accurate number. I'm not really looking at that. I'm just looking at two inches that way. There we are. And you can see my stitching is a bit off. It's okay, people. When we stuff this, it is not going to matter. Look how close I was right there to my two inches. Okay. Now we have this whole piece. It's all cut out nice. I'm going to measure it and see about where I am. Okay, this is nine and an eighth high. And the mother ruler should get, I have one even bigger than this 15 inch ruler. And we are, uh, it's always like this for me, people. When I quilt and stuff, I'm always moving crap around because I'm always having stuff in my way. And we are right just at 16 inches wide. So 9 and an eighth by 16. And that tells me exactly how big I need to cut my interfacing and my backing. And because the interfacing was on top, I'm just going to do that first. So, I know I need at least... Nine and an eighth wide, and typically I'd use the measurements here, but I don't have those. And so I am going to get my bigger, my bigger ruler. I'll be right back. Okay, people, I am back, and I'm going to cut this little piece off right here. And I got my huge, big, big ruler. Okay, so we need nine and an eighth. And I'm going to do about nine and a quarter because um, this end is all wonky. And then I'm going to turn around and do it, cut it the other way to make it nice. So basically just cut a piece off, get this out of my way, and now we can make this nice. And I tend to use these bigger rulers because I like to make my cuts in one. I like to do the side and the top and be done. So I said about 16th and I need nine and an eighth. And if these are, if your uh, fusible interfacing is slightly off, don't worry about it because you don't really have to even have it in your seams. You don't have to be perfect. If you're like quarter inch short or half inch short, that is fine um, because it's just gonna be hiding in the seam allowances. 
Okay, and that is our fusible interfacing. And now we're going to cut our batting, our batting, our backing. All right, and what part do I want to have in this? Let's see. And see, this is where when you're wanting to fussy cut, you end up wasting a whole heck of a lot of fabric. And you know what? I don't even think it matters. I'm not even going to worry about it. I'd love to have this right here. Um, but I, I don't really want to, I don't feel like wasting fabric today, people. So, I am just going to cut, have to go with the way my numbers are going. I'm going to see if this is a straight cut from the last time, and it is. And I need 16, but I don't want the seam allowance in here. Even though you can see there's only a tiny white bit, there's some dots right here. I don't know how well you can see those. That's where um, they ran the fabric through the printer and stuff, and they've got it. They attached it on all the on the selvage, and this is real tough. I don't want that in there. So I'm going to make my 16 right here, so that all I have to do is just cut cut the selvage off. Typically don't want your salvages, people. Sometimes it doesn't really matter. Um, sometimes it does. And to me, today, I don't want it. Okay. Oh, I'm always in forever dropping stuff. Do you hear that? What I drop? The pencil. And I'm going to fold that up later. Okay, so now I just want 16. There's my 16. Line this up with my 9 and an 8. Oops, not over far enough. There we are. I'm really sorry if you're getting part of me in the video and not just my hands. Okay, so now we have our three pieces here. We've got our backing, we've got our interfacing, and we've got our pillow front. What we're going to do now is take this, the pillow front, and we're going to fuse the interfacing to it. And I'm going to pause and set up the camera so you can see me do that. Be right back. Okay guys, I'm back. I have a uh, just a hand towel that I used to use a long time ago in one of my bathrooms and I changed the decoration and I have this out here. This is my towel that I use when I want to iron any of my stitching. Now if you want your, your stitching to be a little more protected, you could get a bigger towel and double it up. Um, I'm not that worried if my stitches go flat. I, this is just a cute little Halloween pillow. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. So I'm going to set my, my stitched piece that's cut to size right on top of the towel. Then I'm going to set the interfacing up right here on it. Now, like I said, if your interfacing was just a little too short, you just want to center it so that it's not too far off one side or the other. Then the next thing I grab is a kitchen towel. Anyway, I lay this right over the top, and you can see where the stitching is under it, and then I lightly spray it with some water. Now, read the instructions of what your fusible interfacing said to do. I, I didn't read them because I've done this interfacing so much, I know exactly what to do. And most often with my bags, I actually use a fabric press. I don't press them myself, it would take me ages. But once your iron's heat, heated up, you're just going to take it and set it down for 15 seconds in each spot. Sometimes I don't wait the full 15 seconds. I'll just move it around and I'll, I'll make sure to keep doing that over and over because you want to make sure that the glue dots on the interfacing adhere well to the back side of your fabric. And this is, um, I press down a little. You may not want to. You may just, the weight of the iron is fine. I just get, get in my little zone. Sometimes I get impatient and want to try to hurry the process along. And you really can't. It takes a certain amount of heat for a certain amount of time to do this. Um, some people won't use the pressing cloth. They just spray the back of that. I don't like to do that. Um, and, and they'll use steam on their iron. I'm sure your thing will tell you to use steam on your iron. I don't use the steam on my iron because, like I said, 
the um, my iron ends up leaking. And the last thing I want when I am uh, sewing or pressing any of my fabrics or anything is that nasty brown water to come out of my iron and stain my fabric. So, not supposed to iron, supposed to press. I broke the quilter rules. Oops. Okay, now if your fusible interfacing went off the edge, you probably find it stuck to your ironing board. That's okay. Um, and then I usually just check the edges to see did it adhere well, and you can see right here, it didn't really. So I'm just going to do a tiny little spritz of water right there and press it down right on the edge. And I can press harder on the edge because there's no stitching there. Perfect. Some of your edges will be fine, some won't. Doesn't matter. Now, what I like to do is take and trim up, and you can probably barely see it, but trim up the edges of my fabric, of the SF, the fusible interfacing, um, and trim it down to the edge where it's supposed to be. There's a little bit here. So I'm going to pause the camera, um, move it back towards my sewing area, and, and trim that up. So when you see me again, it'll be all nice and pretty. Well, really quickly before I go, um, I forgot to tell you, press, press your backing fabric. I will spray mine either with Ellen's Best Press. Um, I don't have that down right now. I buy that thing by the gallon from Amazon because I, like I said, quilters, so I use that stuff all the time. Um, or I'll just spritz it with a little bit of water um, and, and press it. Uh, just to make sure all the wrinkles get out. And I, I'm sorry I forgot to tell you that before. That's definitely something you need to do. And typically I will press my fabric before I even cut it. But I was, I, I didn't today. Oops. <laughs> okay, be right back. Alright, um, we are at the point where we are going to be adding... Well, sewing all this all together. First off, though, what we have to do is figure out how much trim we need around this whole piece. And all I do, and actually I did this already. I'll see if I have enough of this trim to do it again. Um, this is how far I got yesterday. I got to, um, in the video, pinning this before everything went to crap. Sorry if that language bothers you, but that's really how my day felt. Anyway, what I do... <laughs> And I already used, I already know I don't have enough because I've used the rest of the roll. But before I cut it, what I do is I just run this off the roll and I run it all the way around my piece kind of loosely just to make sure I'm going to have enough. And then I, after I've done that, I will cut it. And I always cut extra. See how much extra? I always do that on purpose so I have room to play around with this. This is kind of a whole lot extra, more than I needed, but I think I was just being careful. And it's always good to be careful. Now, these little pom-poms, I'm calling them pom-poms. I think we talked about this, even though they're not technically pom-poms. They need to face up towards your thing because all of this right here, is going to be in your seam allowance. You don't want to sew the pom-poms into your seam allowance. You want this side right here to be in your seam allowance because when it's all sewn together, it's going to look like that. So, what we're going to do is we're going to start pinning. And when I get to the corners here, I'm going to round them like this pin them in place and round the corners. I'm not going to cut them off like I did in the last pillow because we all, all know if you saw that finish that it turned out to be bad. I had to make little tassels for the corners. So um, I'm going to try and use Danielle's new tutorial to speed up the pinning process here. Um, and I'll, I'll stop it so you can watch me pin one of the corners and then we'll speed up through the rest. See how that goes. We are at the, the corner, so 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to pin it straight right at the part where I want to start turning the corner and then put the pin in at the corner right here just to hold it down so that when I'm sewing I've got a good guide and that's a little too tight there you can see how it's scrunched up so I'm going to put this pin a little further back I'm going to hold another pin down here hold it down here with another pin I mean and then just line this edge up and then keep pinning corner and as you saw I took out my pins because when I started pinning I really wasn't thinking you don't want to start in the corner because you need to round the corner come on Christine what you thinking anyway um and you're probably also wondering because I forgot to explain why I am only pinning the trim and I'm not pinning the backing fabric first well that's because first off we are going to sew the trim onto this and I want to use a, a quarter inch um, uh, seam allowance here. I, I want to, when I sew this all together, I don't want any of this outer part sticking up. I only want the pom-poms. And this right here is about a quarter inch wide. Um, without the pom-pom sticking up, just this part of the trim. So what I want to do is I want to sew this trim all the way around just at that quarter inch line, maybe just shy of it, but not too much, excuse me, because I I want, when we fold over the, the side of the pillow, the edge of the pillow that we're going to hand sew, I need these sewn right to that edge. So we're going to sew this as close as we can right now to right under the pom-poms so that when we pin this, the backing to it, it's all sewn down. We don't have to worry about our trim sliding around and we're actually going to sew on that seam allowance we've already, um, the, the line we've already sewn to make sure that we are not sewing over our pom-poms or anything because you can't see it once we put the backing on. So we want to make this as easy as possible. Now, here's where the um, the little lighter is going to come in handy because I'm going to decide where I want this to overlap because remember, this is going to be sewn into the seam allowance. We're only going to see the pom-poms and I think, and they're sort of, pom-poms are sort of overlapping a bit. We don't want too much of that. So what I'm going to do is cut this one right here. And we're going to light it. We're going to light it up, people. Just burn the edge a little. And I'm not going to cut this piece yet. And I'm going to tell you why. When we start sewing this trim all around, it's going to shift on us. And by shift, the presser foot is going to be pressing down and it's going to be pushing it forward. And it's a little elastic-y. I don't know if you can tell. So the presser foot is going to press any of our bulk, any of our extra. It's going to smooth this out and push it forward. So I don't want this cut too small yet. I'm actually going to do it at the sewing machine um, as we're sewing this all. So I will, I will show you how we do that. And then I can make the final judgment exactly where I want to cut this trim. And we're ready. We're going to sew right now, people, right now. This is fun, right? We're having fun. All right, this is the boring part. i got to admit that. But now the, now's the fun part. Let's get to it. Okay, everyone. I decided for those of you who aren't familiar with your machines and you're a little nervous about this, um, I'm going to show you how I'm going to wind my bobbin really quickly. I have an empty bobbin here 
and thread the machine super fast so for those of you who know how to do this please please forgive me for taking some extra time to do this but I think it's really important if any of you are nervous about this I don't want you to be this is fun and this is easy stuff um, so right now my instructions here tell me to bring the thread from the spool here and wrap it around this tiny little there's a tiny little metal knob there and it also says to cross back over this all this does is give the thread some tension so that when it starts winding it doesn't zip and wind out everywhere and create a big huge tangled mess on your bobbin there's going to be a little hole and there's mine right there you're going to want to take your thread put it in between and bring it up through that hole I'm sorry I'm trying to see what you see and do this at the same time now you're going to pop your bobbin over it's going to give you some resistance because there's a little spring right there pop it down all the way you're going to bring the bobbin over to the side hold on to your thread I don't know if you can see my hand do not let this go and do not let it go I what happens is when you depress the pedal the foot pedal it's going to start winding really fast you keep your hand up out of the way hold on to this until you feel enough thread there that if you give this kind of pull firmly it'll break off on its own I'll show you how actually it's been a while so let's hope this works right all right here we go broke off and because my spool of thread is a little it's not normal likes to try to jump off so I just hold my hand right here so it can't okay I thought mine would pop off automatically it doesn't it just stops spinning and so if yours pops off automatically perfect if yours stops spinning do what I did just take your foot off the pedal and then we want to cut it here slide our bobbin off and carefully take our floss off of this because we have to thread this machine a different way now to thread the machine what I do mine comes under this little lever right here and there's a little tiny spring inside here and you pull it straight forward so mine has gone under this metal arm over the back and uh, over the top so it just goes down under and comes around and your machines will have numbers to tell you what you're supposed to do that was number one number two is to bring it down number three up and the thread um, the the thread arm the guide I'm gonna bring it up and I can see there's a hook in there you probably can't see any of this there's a little hook and I'm gonna catch my thread on it and I can feel it's caught bring my thread arm up pulls this thread all the way down there's another little hook right down here and I know you can't really see it but I'm going to hold my thread here put it inside that little hook and that's the most every machine has it it's a little guide to hold your thread right here in front of your needle now some machines will have a threader this one does some don't you need to know the direction you put your thread in if I didn't have this threader I would be threading my needle front to back in through this way some needles are sideways they're twisted sideways my other machine is twisted sideways you need to read your manual and find out which direction now for my needle threader I want to bring my needle I believe it's up on this one yes up as high as it will go and it's right there I bring the threader pull it straight down and then push this lever back which brings the threader into the needle there's a teeny tiny hook there there's also a metal hook right here to put my thread in to to guide it over here there's another tiny little hook on the outside of the needle that will help I can lift my thread up against and then when I pull it back it just pulls a little loop of thread through that's how you use a thread guide um, some of them are a little different so look at your manual see how it goes but they're really easy to use and especially when you have old eyes like me and you can't see the hole anymore for your bobbin mine super easy pop that up put that out of the way it will tell you right here 
there's a little image that shows, oops, you can't see that at all. But there's a little image. It's the bobbin, and it shows the thread coming off this way, and then it has to go around in this little guide here. Your machine should have something like that, or it will tell you in the directions. So, because my thread needs to come off this way, counterclockwise, I'm going to pop it in, just drop it down there, I pull up my thread tail, and I run it through this little guide. There's a little, a little guide right here, little channel. I'm going to run it right in through there, all the way over. Then I'm going to pop this back in, and I want to pull my thread tail up. I don't want my thread tail starting from this, this position, no. You hold your top thread, bring your needle down, bring it back up, and pull. You stop with your, don't use your foot pedal for this, use the hand wheel. And there you go. I always bring my thread tails to the back. The, forgive me if I'm doing stuff weird with my hands. This machine is set up different than my other hand. Um, and if I bump the camera, my other machine has a knee lift and it's, oh, for crying out loud, people. So sorry. Um, if I bump the camera, it's because I'm going to use a knee lift that is not there. All right, so bobbin is wound, machine is threaded. We need to check our settings, and I, you saw me mess around with these dials. I need to make sure that my stitches are going to be okay. Normally, that's, let's see, right around three. So I'm going to do a quick test, and if it's jacked up, I will fix it. See, I'm going around to the back for my my um, lever for the presser foot and it's not there. And I don't want zigzags. I want to be on stitch number two. Actually, that was going to do a buttonhole. Okay. I usually stop with my machine in the needle down position. My other machine does that automatically because I'm spoiled. Um, and these stitches look really good. There's no bumps on the back, which means the um, bobbin is not pulling the top thread down. There's no bumps on the front, which means the, th the top thread's not pulling the bobbin thread up. We're good to go. Number three, we've got our stitch set on the right one, finally, because I just did that. And my stitch length, how long I want my stitches, it's set at about two and a half millimeters. I think we could bump that up just a touch. I'd leave it somewhere around two and a half to three. Okay, let's get this party started. I'm going to do a quarter inch seam allowance. And I forgot to bring my pin magnifier over. Here it is. This foot... The one thing I don't like about this machine is that your um, seam allowance numbers are over here, but the quarter inch doesn't go all the way down except for right here. And normally when people are stitching, I would always tell them to watch the guide where their foot, the edge of their foot is, especially in quilting. Don't watch your needle. I'm not telling you that right now because I know... I need to watch where my needle goes down because I want it right on the edge. So I'm just going to look as I'm sewing, I'm going to make sure this edge is lined up here, but I'm also going to watch the needle to make sure it's going down where I want it. And it's not. I need to move over a little bit. And please forgive my adjustment with this machine right now because it's very different than the one I'm used to. Okay, I just put my needle down where I want it to be so I know um, exactly where my stitch line is going to be. It's going to be right along this edge. I don't know if you can see it. I wish I could do this a little closer, a little better for you guys. It's kind of difficult. But we're going to start sewing. And the first few stitches, I'm going to go forward two or three. And then I'm going to depress the reverse lever, which you cannot remotely see right now. How nice is that? Keep having to adjust everything. I'm going to go back those same two or three stitches. That's just going to lock this into place. Not exactly necessary on trim that we're just sort of basting into place. And I'm going to go around. 
Now, remember what I said, take your pins out as you're stitching. And I am going to stitch all the way around. I will slow down as we get to the corner, the curve. Um, but until then, I'm going to fast forward. Here we are at the corner. And remember I told you that the presser foot would push the trim along, and it has. You can see there is a big gap right here. We are just going to hold this down and guide it around the corner. We know what we want it to look like. It doesn't have to be perfect um, unless you're going to enter this in a show. Then you're really going to want to go a little slower and fuss around. But there are going to be times where I, um, if this gets a little difficult, I'm going to stop. I'm going to lift up my presser foot and turn it to guide it one stitch at a time. Uh, just be patient around corners. This, sh this one should be pretty easy. Okay, here I am. I'm going to move this needle out of the way. Even move this one down. You can even repin it to help you. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Okay, just slowly guide it around. And your machine, use your pedal to manage your speed. Use your hand wheel to help you go around if, you're, if your needle stops up in a funky position. Like that. I'm just going to guide it around. There's nothing wrong with doing any of this just like this. My needle got stuck on the trim. I don't like how the needle stops up in the air, but that's a feature on a different kind of machine. And there we go. Now we're on the straightaway again. Well, just about. And now because I've got so much gap, I'm just going to have to use my fingers mostly to hold this in place and guide it as we go along. things they seem to be coming over and I don't want to catch those in my stitches so I'm just using my I don't have my stiletto in here actually I don't have my stiletto on this part but I am just going to kind of hold those over as they start to go under the foot I'm not going to get the tip of that under my needle though that would be very bad and then stitch through just so it doesn't catch those little balls of fluff. I think I may have caught one up a little further and that was that's just annoying. Coming down into the home stretch and I need to decide where I want to cut off my um my thing and I'm thinking I don't know how well you can see it, but these two, this pom-pom and this one right here, pretty well match up right on, um, as long as I kind of tug this tight. So, I'm going to cut this right at the edge of this, this one. And then I'm going to, oh, what a mess that made, huh? Being careful not to get my fabric or anything. I'm going to light the edge of that melted down and then I'm just going to sew those two ends together just being careful with my needle because remember I just hardened this plastic so I may even use the hand crank to crank the needle over that part um, I'm going to be very careful to hold this all down and this is where, again, I will use my um, seam ripper. I'm looking for my actual stiletto part. Forgive me while I make a racket. Uh, here we go. I've got one of these interchangeable seam rippers. This thing is beautiful. Um, one of my fellow quilters' husbands make, makes these, and uh, they're just amazing. 
Anyway, okay, so I'm going to hold this down while we sew it through, moving my seam ripper back so I don't, I'm going to lift that up just to make sure everything's laying just right. But that's just me. You don't have to worry about it. We're just basting this stuff into place, really. And as I go over that part, I'm actually going to do a couple backward stitches just to hold it all in. And we're going to go forward again. And I'm just now meeting up where my other stitches were. Little back stitching. And we're done. Take this out. And I'm going to trim the threads close to the ends. If your edges are are sort of fraying and they're getting long, go ahead and clip those off. You don't want those getting into your pillow seams or popping out later and they're kind of like this. You know, pull it, I guess, until it comes off or just trim it. Just clip it. Okay, now we're going to move back to the table. I'm sorry for the transition again, but we are going to pin the backing to this piece and then sew it all together. We're getting there. I hope you're having fun. This is supposed to be fun. Okay, guys, we are getting there. Um, we have the trim sewn down, so now that's really not a factor in our sewing. We don't have to worry about it getting pushed out too far, whatever. It's right where we want it. What I'm going to do is I am going to lay the backing side face down, so right sides are together. My stitched, sti the stitched side is up because our trim is on that side. And the backing is going to be laid down right on top of that. And because this will shift around as you pin it, I'm actually going to pin on all one pin on all four sides. I can see it's lined up in the corners. And I'm going to tell you why I did that in just a second. Sometimes as you um, inner, uh, fuse your fabrics and press them, they'll shrink. And I want that backing to stay in place and I want to pin from this side and the reason is is when we're stitching them together the line we're going to be following and we're going to be watching it with our when our needle goes down is the line we previously sewed on because we know um, we don't want this sewed, sewn line to show up um, we don't want to sew too far over so that when we turn it right side out it's um, it's showing there. No, we want to sew right on it. We know it's exactly where we want it to be with our little pom poms. So that's why I um, pinned all four sides. I didn't want the backing to shift when I turned it around. Now we want one of the sides, it doesn't matter which one, to not be pinned all the way down because we need to leave an opening when we sew this so that we can turn the pillow right side out and then stuff it full of stuff in. So since I started pinning this side, obviously this is not the side I'm going to keep open. And we don't need a whole ton of pins here. I just need to look every now and then to make sure that my backing is even, even for the most part with the edges and look, that's not even at all. So I need to take that out, make sure I'm not moving my fabric around, and now we can see that I pulled it up, and it is. And that will happen. This will shift around when you're pinning, so just check it every now and then. Make sure your fabric is even. Okay, I'm going to fast forward and get this stuff pinned. Okay guys, I am at the end where I said we need to leave an opening. So what I'm going to do, and this is how I know where to leave the opening. I just put two pins at where I want my start and stop points. And then I do, look at that pin. Can you see how cro crooked that is? Probably not. Uh, and then I just do a couple pins going along the way I'm sewing. And that's just my own reminder that this is how this is supposed to be the opening and um not to not to sew there not to sew that closed and we're going to move back over to the sewing machine okay here we are back at the sewing machine 
I am going to line up my needle. I'm looking down here and I'm looking to see one where this pin is because that's my starting point. And then two, I'm looking to see where the line, the old stitch line is. Now it's a little difficult because I used cream colored floss and it blends right in. So I'm going to put my foot down here, my presser foot, to where I can see the stitch line. Yep. I need to move it over just a little. There we go. I'm going to take this pin out. Move my needle thing again. My pin keep. Always do that. Now we're going to want to do a few stitches forward and back. Um, and sometimes when I'm doing that where it's an opening, I'll do it a couple of times because I want to make sure those stitches are nice and strong in there because when we turn this right side out, we're putting pressure and tension on both sets of those stitches, the start and stop point. And sometimes if they're not um, locked in place enough, they can pull apart, which isn't a tragedy in and of itself. It's just makes a little more work on the hand stitching end if they start pulling and pulling and making the opening wider and wider it's just wider for us to have to hand stitch it close and I'm sorry if you hear this plastic running around my my presser foot or my pedal was getting away with me getting away from me okay here we go a couple forward a couple backwards and again Okay, and now I'm going to go forward and I'm just going to stitch on the previous line that we did before. And just go slow, be careful around the corners. Um, because for me with this foot, it's really closed up and I can't, I don't have a lot of area to see. I may even hand crank it around to make sure that I'm on that stitch line. And it's okay to do that. And then you want to lift up your foot, turn as you go. I'm just hand cranking around because that's just easier right now as I set it in place and go. Go. Also, if you know where the line is, this foot is, uh, like I said, it's a lot more closed than I'm used to. And if you know where your needle line is, then instead of trying to watch where the stitches are there, watch it here as it's feeding through. If you can find exactly where the path of the needle is, then just feed your stitches straight into the needle. Coming up to the end, so I'm going to do some back stitching forward and back again. I want those stitches really locked into place. And now we're done. I'm going to lift the needle up out of the fabric. We're going to cut this close to the stitching. And now we're going to turn this inside out. So I am going to go back to the table because we are done with the sewing machine. Okay, here we are. Our pillow is still inside out, but we have the opening right here. Uh, before we turn it right side out, remember these corners that we have right here. We're going to trim them up. Now, if you used a bigger seam allowance, like a half inch or a three eighths inch, I would say trim your seam allowance down to about a quarter inch um, and trim your corners. You're going to have um, some tight corners. Sometimes people will notch out here. I'm not worried about my curve. Uh, in this case, I think we'll be just fine. So all I'm going to do is just round the corners at about a quarter inch. All the way around all the corners. We don't need that extra bulk in our pillow uh, at all. We don't want it. We don't want to have to deal with it just going to make it go away. Okay, now right now your iron should be warming up a bit um, and mine's not. So I'm going to be right back and plug it in because we're going to be pressing.
Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, now we're going to pull this right side out. So we've got our fabric here, and what I do before I um, trim up my thread is I turn the backing fabric and I just finger press it. You can't even see that. I just finger press it a little to match up with the sides so that when I go to sew this pillow together, I sort of have a pressed line. I know where this is and needs to match up, and it just helps us when we're sewing. Okay, so reach in all the way in, grab the end right here, and then just pull it through. Gonna pull it through. And then what we wanna do, poke our fingers through into the corners, just kinda push them out a little bit make our corners look pretty. Do it with all four corners. Use your fingers, get in there, and then kind of press them down so you can feel the seam right in there. And I will do that all the way along the seam edge. I will pull it to where I can feel it and I just finger press it down all the way around. So I'm going to speed up the video while I do that, but you guys should be doing that too. Should be pushing out your corners and pressing all the way down. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to go over to the iron and ironing board and I'm just gonna press this and press the edges down and you guys can do the same but I will warn you if you've got a polyester or nylon trim you do not want that hot edge iron on the edge but all I'm doing is pretty much what um, we just did with finger pressing I'm just running my iron and just making sure that this seam is staying nice and flat and I'll just, you know what, I'll move the camera over there and show you because that's really kind of not fair to tell you what to do and not show you. So, let's go do that. Okay, here we are at the ironing board and I'm just going to show you briefly what I meant when I said we're going to press this. Um, I just set my iron down. I don't press too hard in the middle because there's nothing there and I didn't get my towel again to lay this down on. But I'm just dragging my iron, I won't drag in, pressing my iron right here on the very edges. I just want a neat back and I want the edges to stay flat right now. I'm trying really hard not to touch those pom-poms because I know they're made of polyester and nylon or nylon and they're gonna melt. So I'm just being really careful. Now some people will have one of those really small little irons that you can use for applique. I actually have one of those somewhere around here. Um, and that's fine too. But this is kind of overkill. You don't have to do this too much. I just want it when I turn around to look nice. And where I really want to make sure I press it good is right here on this edge. And not so much using the iron, but finger press it. Because I know I want my edge to match up with the rest and I want it pressed over just about like that. And that's why I said let's sew this as close as we can because when we turn this over, now those pom-poms are gonna stay exactly in place. If we'd have basted them a little further, they'd be loose and you have to sew that stuff and it's kind of a pain. And then I'm gonna make sure that this black fabric, the backing fabric, gets folded enough that it's gonna match up at the right spot and I'm gonna press that being careful not to touch my pom-poms too long. Okay, so now let's go and finish this pillow. We're just there, people. We are so close. I hope you're still having fun. Have fun. Here we go. Okay, people, we are ready to finish this pillow. Right now, we are at the stuffing point, and we are going to stuff this thing, and then when we think we're done stuffing it, we're going to stuff it a little more. Now, I just have polyfill. I bought this at, at Hobby Lobby. 
Um, and it was $3.99 for this bag. Weighs 12 ounces. Um, says you can make at least one 12 inch stuffed pillow. I've got more than enough of that for here. I actually had to open it and use it to finish filling some of my last one. But what you need to do is you pull out a thing of stuffing and you sort of, it says massage it. Uh, you can massage it if you want. I just sort of pull it out that way that when I run my fingers in it, I don't feel one big hard clump. But what you're going to do is you're going to stick your hand in here. You're going to stick this stuffing and first you're going to stuff those two bottom corners and you're going to push it into those corners as hard and as much as you can. Just sort of tear it apart, stick it in here, right into those corners. And we are going to really get those corners nice and stuffed. Um, some people will take uh, pieces of batting and use it to stuff the corners because the batting won't shrink up out of the corners. And I've done that in several of my pillows. I'm not doing that in this one because um, I, I had a good experience with this fiber fill the last time for my other pillows and it really stayed in the corners. But see, see how my corner's a little flat? No, we don't want flat corners. I'm gonna push this in here. Now your, um, your bag of batting is gonna come, should come with this tool wrapped in paper, kind of like a straw. You'll fill it right in the middle. And sometimes you can use these to really push push this stuff into the corners. Um, I, I actually use my fingers because these corners are big enough. If you have a small, if you're doing smalls, you may want that. Um, but don't push too hard that you rip through your, your seams. You don't want to do that. You just want to make sure you get it in there. Okay. Work it in there a little more. And I'm going to feel this and sort of scrunch it around because we don't want to get too hard of a knot in one place. You want to make sure it gets scrunched and moved around. Okay, people. Let's get to stuffing. Keep stuffing your pillows. Stuff, stuff, stuff. We're at the point where I feel like I've stuffed and I'm not sure that I can stuff anymore. And I'm not sure that I'm right. So I'm just going to take it, sort of massage the pillow around. If you don't want to touch your stitching like that, do it from the back. That's fine. Feel it. Look at your line. Does it feel like you could use a little more stuffing in some of them? The corners, definitely. These front corners, I haven't worked on them too much. But I'm looking at this. And yeah, see that? I can definitely get more stuffing in here. We need more stuffing. Um, and like I said, this is one of those right when you think you're done stuffing, keep on stuffing. Keep stuffing, people. Here we go. Okay. I got that whole bag of stuffing, at least what was left of it, in this pillow. I think we did pretty good. Just like to kind of massage the massage is such a terrible word for this polyfill stuff. Oh, I'm not gonna make the joke that I just had pop in my head. Shut your mouth, Christine. Nobody wants to hear it. Okay, so sometimes you'll feel little hard knots in there. Just kind of take your fingers and scrunch them around in it and kind of break it up, move it around. And it's going to feel really full right here. And this is where we're going to have to sew it closed. So this is where you're going to want to pin it. And, and if you have any of those clover clips, um, like, hang on just a second. Any of these clover clips, which I probably should have put in the beginning, these work great here. But since I didn't mention that you could use these in the beginning, I'm going to pin it. Because now all we're doing is getting this, this ready to sew closed. 
We are that close, people. We're just going to sew this pillow up and you are done. So remember that press line I talked about? I'm going to fold this backing and then take it right up to the stitched line on the edge of the pillow. And you're going to have to keep fussing and fidgeting with it, um, mainly because one, it's stuffed full, and two, the fiber fill wants to escape. Uh, and if you'll notice, your work area is probably covered with little things of fiber fill. And I'm sorry about that. Um, you probably want to just uh, uh, use your lint roller at the end. So all I do is just sort of push them together and put a little pin right there. And not all the way across, though, because I'm going to need to stick my needle and the knot in here, and I need room to do that. So I probably should, I'm going to pin one or two more. Then we're going to thread our needle so that we're ready to stitch this close. Oops. It's a little fid fidgety, fiddly uh, right here. Don't get discouraged. You just need to put it in its place. Heck, even if you have binder clips, use binder clips if that's easier. You just need something to hold it down. And just push your stuffing away right now. It'll fill in when we're when we're done and we massage our pillows. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. We need to cut off a length of thread. Now, this one I am matching the front color. Because if a stitch comes through here to the front as we're as we're sewing. It's not going to show up. Nobody's going to see it. And nobody is going to be looking at this back trim edge of your pillow. If they are, they are not your friend. You send them away and out of your home. No, thank you. Um, I have a bunch of needles to choose from. Ooh, I saw the one I wanted. I usually use a smaller one. Do not use your tapestry needles for this. You need one with a sharp point. And I choose one with a big eye because um, I don't have my needle threader here right now. And since I'm not going to use it and I didn't tell you that you should use it and I don't even know that you have it, that's cheating, right? I can't cheat. Okay, I'm going to do what's called a quilter's knot. You've got your end of your knot here. I don't know if you can see this. End of the knot and your needle. You're going to take and bring your thread here. Let's try to do this where you can see what I'm doing. At the back side of the needle, you're going to hold it between your thumb and your forefinger. You're going to wrap like three, four, five times, whatever. You're going to slide it down and you're going to hold it really tight. Now I put my hand in the loop that is now made because it helps me guide the thread. Because I also have the thread tail right here that's hanging off. Now I've got those loops really tight in between my... I'm flipping you off. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was such an accident. Okay. I've got those really tight in between my thumb and my forefinger. I'm going to push the needle only up with my thumb. I'm not going to grab any... any thread that's there. Just the needle. Oh, you guys cannot even remotely see. Okay, so just have the needle holding those loops tightly in between my thumb and forefinger. Ah! And just pull it all the way to the end. And then you have your knot. Oh, if I could like see what I'm doing. Anyway. You know what? Look up a YouTube video where the person knows what the heck they're doing and how to explain it nicely. Anyway, that's how you do it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here. Now this is kind of hard because I'm trying to look through the camera and at what I'm doing at the same time. But right there is our, all of our back stitches. That's where we connected this. I'm trying to take my needle up and into that fold right there so it's right in that seam allowance. So I'm going to pull it through and now our needle is caught right back in there. And I'm just going to stick it there for a few minutes while I finish pinning up the back of this. So now we are 
all pinned up and ready to go. I'm going to flip this over. So sorry, I just bumped the camera. I'm going to work from the back. I'm going to show you a few stitches and then we'll speed it up because you don't really want to watch me do all this. All right. I'm going to do kind of a, a modified ladder stitch. Most, most pillows you could whip stitch, which is to go from front to back, front to back all the way. And it just makes a little, little whip stitch. And that's perfectly fine. But our problem is I have this pom-pom trim here. So what I have to do is go from the back to the front. And I have to make sure that I catch this back fabric and the front fabric. A ladder stitch, a good ladder stitch, you won't see the stitches at all. Um, so, but this one, because of how I, I started, I'm, you're going to see a teeny tiny stitch there. So I'm making sure I've caught the back fabric and I'm going straight through to the front fabric. And you want a heavy duty needle because if your stuff is thick, it's going to take some pushing to get through. Okay. Now I've got it at the front. Now to make it the ladder stitch, I'm actually going to put it in the hole it just came out of. I don't know how well you can see this. And slide it along that seam edge inside. So it's going in along the fold of the fabric like an eighth to a quarter inch. I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to make sure that my thread doesn't grab those pom-poms, which I know from experience. Okay, so now my my thread has been run from about right here, wherever that was that I went through, over to here on the Ada side. Now I'm going to push it through to the back side. Back in that same hole, make sure to go through the seam allowance and pick up the black backing fabric. I keep calling it black just because it is, but your backing fabric. Okay. Now, to make the ladder stitch again, I'm going to go back in the hole and just run it through that creased edge. It's inside the creased edge. It's really hard to see. Super sorry. And you don't have to do this too much. Don't worry about it too much. But I'm just running it through. It's kind of hard to hold this pillow that's being a little full and difficult. Just sliding it over, running the thread over just a little bit, and then I'm going to, you can see the gap between the edges. Make sure this fabric is up. Sometimes it's easier just to take the pin out, hold the fabric where you want it. Up here, I want to try to cover that stitched edge pick my needle back up and then run it straight through to the other side and again you may see little tiny stitches on the back but once this pillow is done nobody should be looking that close at your seam move it over now I got stuck in the there we go And now my thread is on the front, right here. And I'm just going to put my needle back in right where it came up just to move the thread down. I need it down like an eighth to a quarter inch. And it's running inside that fold in the seam allowance, just under it. Now we're going to push it to the back. You know, I'm not really happy with this popcorn trim because it, it frayed and everything on the roll it wasn't the best. Okay, I'm going to push it straight through the other side, making sure that I've got the backing fabric. Don't catch pom poms. Now we're going to run it down. This is the, think of this as the sides of the ladder. Got to run it down. It's hidden inside that fold right there. Run it down, and now we need to run this, the, it, like the rung. Think of this as the rung to the other side of the ladder. I'm going to push it right over, right through to the other side. You're wanting to make sure you catch your backing fabric and the front. OK, 
okay and you're pulling tight as you're doing this gonna run it down just inside this fold not all the way through we're just running it right down the edge gotta see where it is there it is bring it up and then we're gonna push it through to the other side stitch. I'm going to show you how I finish this off. Okay, I'm going to run it right down. My ending point is right. <laughs> it's hard to see. It's right here. And you'll know where your ending point is too. You see a bunch of little stitches from where we went back and forth. So, I'm going to stitch over to it. I'm going to catch I'm going to put my needle in, catch just a tiny bit of the backing, and I've got some of the trim, and I'm going to just put my needle in just part of the way. I'm going to hold my needle, I'm going to take the floss, a floss, <laughs> the thread, push my needle up, not all the way through, get those pom-poms out of my way, I'm going to take my thread and wrap it around three to four times, two, three, four. Push it down tight. This is exactly what I was supposed to be doing earlier. And then hold, hold those, um, those, the thread that's been wrapped around tightly in between my thumb and my forefinger. I'm gonna push this needle up till I can grab it. I'm gonna pull it through. I'm gonna keep holding really tight. And I pulled it so tight, my, uh, thread broke off but right there you can see the knot and thank goodness I have just enough tail because I like to bury that that tail so I have to take my needle off my thread got a little tired there at the end going back and forth in between your seam allowance like that especially this rough Ada takes a lot out of your thread and it really weakens it so I've got to thread my needle again I don't know if you can see that or not or if you even care to but we're just going to bury this. And I do not thread my needle. I needle my thread. Hold the thread in between my forefinger and my thumb really tight. And then I just bring my needle down over it. Needle the thread. Do not thread the needle. It makes it so much easier. Okay, there's my little knot right there. I'm going to run this needle right down next to that knot. I'm going to find right where it is. And I'm going to run it through, pop it out somewhere else in my pillow, pull it all the way through. Don't drop your needle like me. If you've seen my other videos, you know I'm a fumble fingers. I said that the last one. Pull that, tug it in tight so that knot, that knot goes down into your seam. Tug it in tight. And then what I do is I pull this thread and I push down with the pillow really tight or whatever it is usually this is even how I bury threads in quilts and I try to snip as close as I can without getting the fabric so that when the fabric and everything pops up the rest of that thread tail is buried inside there and this is our back and yeah we can see a little of the seam but we're gonna scrunch this pillow up we're gonna move some of that polyfill up in there Get our edges looking nice, smush it in. You could sort of grab it with your fingers, push it over, do whatever you need to to massage the polyfill. I just, just do not like that. In place, and then we're going to take that lint roller I was talking about, which I put far, far away because this polyfill gets everywhere. We're just going to give this a nice little roll. On the back, especially the back because it's black. Roll it. 
check it out. Make sure you didn't miss anything. That's all kind of bluch. Didn't, couldn't really see that, but it's there. And that's it. We're done. Play with your corners a little bit if you like. I think it turned out good. Okay, I'm going to turn this camera around and wrap up this video. Well, you guys, we did it. Um, I hope you had as much fun doing this as I did. Um, I'm really sorry for all of the transitions and the moving around. This is the first time doing this. I'm still not completely happy with my pillow because I have a lot of extra stuffing right here. And I did that on purpose so I can move it over. Um, and, and I will. It just takes a little a little playing around with your pillow. Um, if you have any questions, if I didn't cover something right, or if I said something that just made zero sense to you, please leave me a comment below and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, if you have any questions about sewing machines or um, if there's interest for like a basic sewing series, um, let me know that. Let me know what you'd like to learn or do um, with some of your machines and I'll, I'll see if there, it's a video that we can do um, and I'll do it if there's enough interest. Um, there's lots of little fun things you can make with your sewing machines and you don't have to have a heavy duty or fancy sewing machine. I'm, I'm telling you, I wouldn't do that unless you're seriously looking into sewing and into sewing different types of things. Um, because all that, all that is a factor in your decision when buying a sewing machine. And I wouldn't go out and, and buy the best or the biggest uh, without at least trying sewing for a bit and seeing if it's your thing. Uh, I think that's it. Um, if you made it through this and you made it through all my craziness and my instructions, congratulations. Um, if I sounded like I was talking down or condescending, that was not my intention. I came at this tutorial as though I was teaching someone who had never even seen a sewing machine before. Um, and I hope it comes across that way. It's, it's only um, to try to, to not take for granted that you guys know everything about sewing machines. So please take, take um, how I was talking and explaining things in that vein, that I, that I really did this from the perspective of trying to teach someone who'd never sewn anything in their life. Um, and that's it. I think we did it. I'm so proud of you. Oh, if you did sew something, please tag me on social media. Um, tag me on Instagram. I'm there to stitch all the things. Um, if you, if you make anything with your pillow, please tag me. Leave me a message. I'm excited. I want to see it. I want to see what you made. And don't worry about perfection. Uh, it's a throw pillow. I'm going to just throw mine on the couch, be done with all these other things. But in the meantime, it's going to stay in my room so I can look at it. It's purdy. Super purdy. It's not going to fit there. All right. That's it. That's it, y'all. We did it. Round of applause for you. I'm so proud of you for even trying. Even if you got halfway through and said, forget it. At least you tried and you decided this isn't for me. And if you got that far, good for you. Um, I will see you in my next video. Hey, happy stitching. Stitch all the things, people. All the things. Bye.